Thank 
Because sometimes it's sad and it's like, I just want to shut down. And like when people pass away or whatever, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I'm just not going to like love on anybody, which is not good. Let's uh, pray for Darby and uh, Jeff and Sarah. Thank you pray where you are, pray for her throughout the week. Um, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for Darby. Thank you for just the, the cool way you opened up this job for her and then just the new things she's got to do there. Um, Lord, I pray that you continue to bless her and let her coworkers know that you are with her, that your hand is on her. Um, Lord, I pray that as she loves people, that you will give her a supernatural love and loves hard people, difficult people, challenging people. And I pray that people see your love in her. God, I pray that you will comfort her heart when people that she's walked alongside um, die or suffer hardship, Lord, that you will help her uh, to be able to grieve that and still love. And Lord, we pray that you will just bless this organization as they do good in the community and continue to bless Darby as she works with them to expand their reach to help people who are hurting. And I pray all these things I believe in Jesus with. Amen. Thank you for doing that, Darby. Yeah, sure. So, oh, oh there's nothing great going there. So, uh, what's in the box? As soon as I see a box, I immediately start thinking, like, what's in this box? Why is there a box? Like, why can't I see what it is? Uh, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with buried treasure, and I would just dig random holes all over my parents' yard. They loved it. They did. <laughs> they made it. Um, you know, my dad would be mowing, and then the mower would just go into a hole. And he's like, did you dig another dead? I was like, I'm looking for buried treasure, Dad. It's out there. So whenever I see a box, I want to know what's in it. You know? What's in this box? You don't know. Um, if, does anybody want to close your eyes, come up here and reach into the box? I'll let you keep whatever you touch. Does anybody want to do that? I was eager to do it. Okay. You know, immediately what you have to consider is, can I be trusted? Like, with your history with Alex, is he somebody you can trust? Like, is he somebody who's going to put something gross in there or something dangerous? There's going to be a snake in there, you know? Like, is there going to be a spider? Is there going to be something horrible, funny? He's got to come immediately consider his history with me, my character. Like, what would Alex do here? Like, what's he trying to accomplish? And uh, apparently, I trust me quite a bit. So, if you want to close your hand, are you sitting there? Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your hand. Close your hand. That makes sense. Thanks so much for being willing to come up. I'm glad you trusted me. I, you know, I didn't know who would actually come up. Oh, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that's exactly what faith is like. It's like blindly reaching into a box and not knowing what's inside of it. When we take a step of faith, it's like blindly reaching into a box and saying, there might be something bad in there. There might be something that bites me. There could be ten dollars. You know, there could be something terrible. Do I trust God enough to reach inside of a box that I can't see inside? Just like Al had to think about, like, would Alex put a snake in there? He'd probably be like, no, he, Alex isn't crazy. He wouldn't do that. We have to think about that with God. Like, is God going to put something dangerous in this step of faith where it's going to hurt us or harm us? Now, the rest of you who sat out here, you could be like, I bet there's something good in that box. How many of you thought there was something good? A few of you. How many of you thought there was probably something funny or bad? A lot of Al thought there would be something funny or bad, but he came up anyway. That's awesome. But you know what? Just because you thought that, that wasn't faith. Just because you thought there was something good in there, you had to actually reach in and touch it. You had to actually take the risk for it to be faith. See, faith involves some effort. It involves getting out of your chair and actually reaching into the box. You can sit out there all day and say, man, I bet there's $10 in there. I bet there's something good in there. But until you reach in, you haven't really taken a step of faith. You've thought about it, but you haven't really taken a step. Um, if you need a new job, should you say, I'm just going to leave my faith when you get a new job? Or should you send out some resumes? Should you text some friends and see good openings? If you have cancer, should you get chemo? Or should you just say, God, I, I think God's going to heal me? Well, you should do both, right? Like, you should send out a resume and believe you're going to get a job. You should uh, get chemo and believe that God's going to heal you. Faith and action aren't mutually exclusive. They go together. 
Sometimes we call our apathy, our tendency to stay still and do nothing, faith. Sometimes we choose not to do anything and we tell people it's because of our faith. Faith doesn't mean we don't work for what we believe God will do. And this isn't a contradiction. In James 2.26, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he says, faith without works is dead. He says, if you have faith without action, it's dead. That's not real faith. When we work for what we believe in, it means we believe enough to put forth energy and effort because we think God's going to empower our efforts. We're willing to do it because we think God's behind us. Not doing anything isn't faith, it's actually doubt. If we don't believe in it enough to put forth effort, why should we expect God to put forth effort? Now, over the last few weeks, we've been exploring the concept of faith. Faith is believing that there are true things that you cannot see. Everybody exercises some kind of faith in your life, whether it's religious faith or relational faith. You believe in things you can't see. It just happens. We believe in things that we can't see, but we see their effects all the time. And we're working off this premise that spiritual faith is like a flame. You can catch it from someone else. The reason that I'm a follower of Jesus is because there were people around me who exercised faith, and I caught some of it. It sparked something in me. The impressive faith of a friend can set your spiritual life afire, and your faith can light the embers of faith in somebody around you. Now, we've been exploring what's called the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and we looked at a whole bunch of stories from the Old Testament and how they exercised faith, and many times how they failed and failed, but one expression of faith really catapulted them so that they're remembered as a hero of faith. And today we're looking at Noah. In Hebrews 11, 7, it says, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is keeping with faith. Now, first off, have you ever wondered why we call Noah's boat an ark and Indy's face, Nazi face man being box an ark? Why are they both called arks? You ever thought about that? Those are the things that keep me up at night. You know, I'm like, why are those both arks? One's a boat, one's a box, right? Um, the word ark literally means box. The Hebrew word taba means box on water or boat. It's the same word used when Moses, in the story of Moses, his parents are like, the Egyptians are going to kill him. And they put him in an ark and float him out on the now. Some translations will say a, a box or a boat or some kind of raft. That it's literally the same word used for ark. It literally means a box on water. And then it's a different word for the ark of the covenant. It's aron, but it's also box. It just means a box, not on water. And so that's why they're both called arcs. So nobody cared about that except me, but I'm like, uh, for a long time, I'm like, this, they can't both be arcs. They're different things. It's like throwing a car and a plane, the same thing, right? These boxes, though, were both intrinsically tied to faith in the Old Testament story. Israelites, by faith, would sprinkle blood before the Nazi faith melting box, and um, it would atone for their sins. Moses' parents, by faith, send him adrift in a box on the now. What a, you know, what a story to start out. Like your parents put you in a box and float you out on the water. And Noah, by faith, built a giant box so his family and some animals would survive the flood. So there you go. The Bible is a story of boxes. Um, you know, the next time you're introducing the Bible, someone be like, are you fascinated by boxes? Because this book has some great stories about boxes. I had a whole segment here about the episode from Friends where Chandler's in a box, and uh, everybody I talked to said no one got that reference. Anybody Chandler in a box? Anybody know that reference? Okay, I'm glad I didn't do it. <laughs> so, you know, just, uh, just a handful of us. Okay, so Noah, whose complete story is found in Genesis 6 through 9, that's three chapters, that's a lot of reading, we won't read it all today. But if you read it, he spent somewhere between 60 and 120 years building the ark. Uh, because of the passage, sometimes it's hard to tell how long. Uh, because of his children's age, we can kind of guesstimate somewhere between 60 and 120 years building the ark. Um, apparently, people lived a lot longer back then. That's a long time to work on a project and not give up. I start a project, and I'm like, is this over yet? Like, I'm ready to move on to the next thing. If I was building a boat for 120 years, I'd be like, is this flood really coming after year five? Maybe after year one, after the six months mark, I'd be like, this flood really coming? I rarely have the patience for long projects. I get bored with sermon series, 
And I'm like, okay, we're talking about about faith. Let's move on to something else. I'm sick of Genesis. I'm sick of this. Let's move on to something else. After the third week, I'm like, okay, I'm bored with this. Let's do something new. That's why we jump around so much. Because I just can't stick with the same thing. I'm sorry. Um, I, it takes faith to stick with something that isn't producing quick and flashy results. It takes faithfulness to stick with something that isn't producing quick and flashy results. Um, I'm a Minecraft player. It's like something about it. Maybe it's the control freak in me, but I can place every block exactly where I want it, and no one can move it except me. I, I might be dead a therapist. Um, but I have a hundred worlds started because I'll have the vision of something, and I'll build two things in that world, and I'll be like, oh, I'm bored with this. I'm starting a new world because I have a new vision. I'm going to do a new thing. Sometimes sticking for one thing for a long time produces the best results. As Americans, we love new things. But it is the aged things that are most valuable. The aged wine, the aged cheese. Um, Sean and Angie just bought an antique TV stand out of reclaimed barn wood. Because it has history, it's more valuable, and they sell it at a higher price, but it also looks cooler, you know? The aged things are most valuable. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the paraphrase of the Bible, the message, said, we all need to learn that long obedience in the same direction. He says a life of faith is a long obedience in the same direction. I go in 20 different directions, and I need to learn a long obedience in the same direction. The average pastor in North America, how long do you think they stay at their church? 10 years. Less. Three. One less. Three. One year. Okay, a little bit more than one in three. It's six. It's up a little bit from where it was. It used to be four in the 90s. It's up to six. Most pastors stay less than six years at a church. Um, but studies have also shown that a pastor's most impactful ministries at churches always happen after year seven. Isn't that interesting? So pastors always leave the year before they start to have their biggest impact. And I, I think about that. Like, how many times have I given up on a step of faith right before I was about to have my biggest impact? I was about to see the biggest things happen as a result of my faith. We often give up on our faith right before our faith is affirmed. Right before it's, um, it's revealed that everything that we've been hoping in and dreaming in is real. It's often, uh, I'm often in a rush to get to the next new thing, and sometimes the best thing is the thing I have right now once I add a little bit of personal maturity to it. Faith is being willing to do the right thing, the thing God told you to do, even if you don't see any results for a long time. Now, I think sometimes people talk about taking a leap of faith, right? We've probably all heard that. It's a pretty common cultural thing to say. In a leap of faith, I think that's a relatively easy decision to make because in a leap of faith, you instantly fall or you instantly fly, right? It's a leap. It's a one-time decision. Very few people get to make a leap of faith. Most of the time, we are making, we're running marathons of faith, where day after day, we keep running and we're not even sure we're heading towards the goal line. We're like, I just got to keep running. I'm just going to keep trying this thing. And we're like, I've just got to keep running this marathon of faith and hope there's a goal at the end. A leap of faith is instant. Most of the time, our faith takes a long time to actually be affirmed. Now, notice that Noah here, he didn't sit around, and God said, hey, there's a flood coming. Um, I wanted to warn you. Um, Noah didn't sit around and say, man, I just can't wait for God to bring that boat by. You know, isn't that interesting? He didn't do that. He believed that there was a flood coming, but he also believed that he needed to produce a boat, not God. Because of his faith, he did the hard work of building a boat. Working hard isn't antithetical to faith. It is faith. Noah built the ark, but God brought the animals. We do our part, and God does the supernatural part we can't. My human tendency is to be lazy and ask God to do my part, or to be arrogant and try to do God's part. Or when God does a part, try to get credit for it. <laughs> Faith and obedience, according to A.W. Tozer, are opposite sides of the same coin. If you have faith, you'll actually practice it. If you say you have faith, but you don't do anything with it, you don't really have faith. Inaction is often a sign that we really don't think God is going to show up. So why do you even try? Like, God's not going to be in this. 
I have to watch this in myself. Sometimes I just get like apathetic and like, man, nothing's gonna happen. Like, why are you putting forth any effort, right? That's the opposite of faith. When you have faith, you put forth the effort because you think God's gonna show up. We often don't really want to partner with God. We either want Him to do it all for us, or we want Him to let us do it all and to stay out of it. God wants to do things with us because He's a relational being who longs to know us and be known by us. Now, Noah almost certainly faced ridicule and rejection as he built a boat on the land far away from the sea. For 120 years, he's building this gigantic box. That's the word ark, right? That's a box that's going to go on water. But he literally built a box on water on land. And uh, can you imagine people walking by and they're like, the sea's 30 miles that way, Noah. You know, you missed it by a little bit. Um, his faith probably agitated their apathy. See, Noah was building a boat on dry ground far away from the sea, and he probably looked crazy, but he wasn't crazy. He was just seeing farther than they were. Imagine if you could go back in time to January 2020 and warn people about the COVID pandemic. Think how crazy you would look. Could you imagine me in January 2020 standing up? You're like, guys, hoard the hand sanitizer and the paper. There is something coming, and I just feel like, you'd be like, he's crazy. Let's go find another church. This guy is crazy. Like, what kind of psychopath, you know? I'd be going up with something, and he's coming, wear a mask. You'd be like, crazy. This guy's crazy. But if we could do that, we would actually just be seen a little bit farther than everybody else. When you exercise faith, if it's from God, then you're seeing a little bit farther than the rest of us. And sometimes that drives us to a point where we ridicule or reject. And maybe somebody's just seeing a little bit farther than us. And futurists, I'm obsessed with futurists. If you read about futurists on the internet, they're always trying to look at patterns in business and society and culture to find out where things are headed. Um, futurists, though, can look crazy until the future becomes the present. Then you're like, oh, that guy really knew what he was talking about. That lady really knew what she was talking about. A person acting on faith seems crazy until what they saw in their head or in their heart becomes something they can touch with their hands. I was reading that the average entrepreneur who starts new businesses has four failed startups before having a successful one. Um, leading one business commentator to look at those stats and suggest the only difference between a successful entrepreneur and a failed one is the persistence to keep trying after failure. Or another word for persistence that the Bible would use is faithfulness. Continuing to practice faith over and over and over again. Faith is looking ahead while apathy tells you to look at the past, to look at your lack of results or your failures or your disappointments. Faith said those were stepping stones, and the next step might get you to your goal. Um, so, we can't talk about Noah's Ark though without talking about the nasty parts of this story. We usually have this really, uh, go back a slide for me, Sean. Yep, so we usually have this very colorful graphic for Noah's Ark, and we show this to children, right? And we're like, what a lovely story about fuzzy animals getting onto a giant box on the water. Um, it's hard to believe, though, that we tell this story to children. Everybody in the world died in the no no in the art story. That's not a good story to tell kids. Like, that's crazy. Um, some people paint their nurseries with the Noah's Ark thing. I hope no one can hear it as because what I say may be offensive, but uh, that's like painting your nursery in a World War II theme. Like, everybody died in this story. That's not a good story. Uh, or saying, yes, I decorated my baby room in a pandemic theme, you know? Like, that's just a weird thing to do. In the flood story, everybody dies except for eight people. That's a pretty terrible story. That's pretty dark for a nursery or a children's mural. Um, I know sometimes in churches we'll have an area for the kids and they'll do a, a Noah's theme. And I'm like, have you read that story? Like, it's not a pretty story. This verse, though, says that Noah's faith condemned the world. What does that mean? How does your faith condemn somebody else? How does my faith seal judgment on someone else? That feels weird. Our faith, though, is what it's saying, contrasts the lack of faith in other people. When we have faith, it leaves other beings who have the same information we have without an excuse. Remember in school when everybody bombed a test and the teacher's like, I'm going to grade on a curve because nobody got it right. Even the smartest kids, the kids who studied the most, nobody got this right. I probably just tested it wrong, so we're going to grade 
on a curve. And then sometimes the teacher's handing out papers like everybody got an F, oh, except for this one kid. Alex, you got an A, and everybody in the class turns and looks. It's like, we're gonna beat you up on the playground now. Because now the teacher can't grade on a curve. Because that one kid had to go and do a good job and ruin it for the rest of us, right? The whole class glares at him. Um, that's kind of what Noah's faith did. That's what he's saying. He's like, they had the same information that Noah did, but they weren't interested. As modern Westerners, the idea of God flooding the planet and killing every human seems barbaric and cruel. I read that and I'm like, that's terrible. That's a terrible thing. But the imagery here in the story is very important. You have to understand what's happening, what the authors are trying to convey. God uses water, and he does so as a result of the violence on the earth. In Genesis chapter 6, it says there was such violence on the earth that it was continual violence, that every human being was violent. And it was just constant killing and war all the time. And God said, I'm sick of it. I didn't create humans to destroy. I created humans to create. They're doing the opposite of what I wanted. If they want to be destroyed so much, I'll simply let them be uncreated. Um, when we went through the series on Genesis, we talked about how the ancient Israelites, their cosmology of the universe was that there were these waters. And God pushed out this space inside the waters to make the sky, pushed out the space to make the land. This is not a scientific explanation of what happened, but this is like their ancient Israelite imagination of what happened. Um, and so if you read Genesis chapter 1, it says God's spirit was hovering over the waters before he makes water. And you're like, what the heck? What is happening? Well, this was this idea of there was this cosmic void, this cosmic sea. Uh, avoidness, and that's what he pushed out in order to create. This is a very poetic way of explaining the creation story. And so what God is doing said is that, like, okay, if you want to just destroy everything I created, I'll just collapse the void back on itself. We'll just let creation uncreate itself. It's a little bit different story than God like, and a wave over here to destroy, and a wave over here to destroy. The author is trying to convey to us He's just going to let creation collapse in on itself. He's like, if creation is just going to try to destroy itself, we'll just let it go back to nothingness. He lets the thing he wove together completely unravel. The order and the beauty and everything. He's like, they've been pulling apart. Sometimes um, when Darby is knitting or crocheting, Hagrid gets a string and he starts pulling apart her work. Um, and at some point you're just like, okay. I'll just let the whole thing go. Let the whole thing unravel and go back just an empty spool of yarn. No design, no order, no beauty. In 1 Peter 3.20, it says, Those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. Um, this passage is interesting to me because it says, God made the boat so big, he gave the designs for Noah to build this box on the water, and it was so big so that it would take so long so that he could be patient with people. That's the type of God that we talk about when we talk about Yahweh and the God of the Bible. He's patient with people. He likes to give people a long time to think about what they would do. For 120 years, people saw Noah go to the boat far away from the sea, and at any point they could say, hey, can I give you a hand? Can I get a spot on that boat? Can I be a part of the first Disney Cruise Line ship? You know, like, and uh, they could have jumped in and been a part. Um, but they didn't. The ark took so long to build so that more people had time to see it and enter into it and be saved. Sometimes our step of faith is taking a long time so people have time to get involved, to be a part, to get a hold of what we're doing and what we're about. When we rush to the finish line, Oftentimes, I leave people behind, or even worse, I run over people in the process, trying to get to where I want to go. Um, in church planting, they often say things like, if you haven't reached a sustainable number by year four, it will never happen. That's just the stats. Faith doesn't work on time games. It doesn't work on stats. It's not designed around what corporate businesses do and how corporate businesses work. Faith rarely works within a model. If God always worked the same way, if I could look at everybody else and be like, oh, it always happens like this, what faith would there be? I'd be like, oh, we just follow the same pattern and everything happens the same way. You don't need God then because you have statistics. Um, I heard an interesting interview with Tim Keller. He was a pastor in New York City, a uh, brilliant thinker. He's been diagnosed with a very severe form of cancer, and so he's just been thinking back over his life. And someone asked him, they said, what would you do differently? Like, 
Here you are. He's like, I wouldn't change what I believe. I'm still uh, a firm believer in it. But he said this, I've relied too much on stats and too little on the spirit. And I think sometimes we uh, set aside faith for what's predictable or what we think we can expect, what we think we can reason and logic. And faith doesn't have to have market research because it leaves without seeing. Faith allows for God to tell a unique story with you and with me that isn't going to follow anyone else's story. It's going to look different, and that's okay. Um, the Noah story ultimately introduces us to a theme that we're going to see again and again in the story of the Bible. Out of the many, God rescues some to be part of a new creation. The pinnacle of this is in Jesus. Jesus rescues us from the flood of sin and death, and by becoming his students by faith, we become part of a new creation, a fresh start for humanity, a humanity 2.0. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. We're part of this new way of loving people and living that is a small glimpse of what the kingdom will look like when Jesus comes as king. So, that's the end. What do you need to do? Often we're waiting on God to do the supernatural, and he's waiting on us to do the natural. We're like, I'm just waiting by faith for God to do it all. Sometimes we have to take the first step and say, what can I do so that God can show up with the supernatural? Jesus is waiting patiently for you to take that step of faith, to chase that dream, maybe start that business, have that conversation, to announce you're publicly ready to side with Jesus. Whatever it is, don't be afraid to open the box. Because he's a God that you can trust. He's not going to put a snake in there. He's not going to put a silly buddy or something weird in there. He's a good God. You can trust him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for living and dying and living again and welcoming us into the family of God, inviting us to be students of how you live and love, how you behave, how you treat people, how you live out your life in this world. God, when we be good students as we live by faith, believing that there is a better kingdom to come and there is a counter story uh, that we can live out in our lives by loving people like you did, by living like you did. Uh, Lord, I pray that if anyone's right on the edge of opening the box and reaching in and saying, I'm going to take a step of faith, but I pray that you just reassure them that you're a good God. You love them and it's for them and it's always patiently waiting for us to take the next step.
time you all came out yesterday and put down the mulch for the art center, and we thank you for that. And that's what it means to serve the community and not be served by it. We believe that loving our neighbors and acting in better ways can show our neighbors that we live and love like Jesus. This week, may you be encouraged to act on your faith, reach into that box, and be faithful to Jesus. You are dismissed.